Hello and welcome back to World War II TV and the second of our double build today. And if you didn't see the earlier show with David O'Keefe about Operation Ruthless, go back and check it out. It was really interesting and I learned things. I thought I knew about it, but then I found out, as always, I didn't know as much as I did having watched the show and had David on as guest. But today we are going to later in the war, 1944 this time. And if you remember, our earlier shows this week were operations that didn't happen. This is one that did happen, although we will be mentioning others that didn't happen before the one that did happen did happen. Um, my guest today, Kyle Glover, has been on uh, once or twice before, and I have been on his podcast. He is one half of the History Rage podcast, the link of which is in the description below. If you haven't checked out that podcast, do so. It is historians ranting about things that they wish the world would understand about history. I've been on it, but people much more important than me have been on it. So check that out. He's also part of a foreign field, a living history group that goes to places like Chalk Valley and other things like that and does presentations about all aspects of history. So we are in good hands. So um, I'm bringing Kyle in now. So good evening, Kyle. How are you today? Good evening. Thank you. You're incredibly kind and gracious for your introduction there. Thank you. Well, it's all what goes around comes around. And, and as I said before we went live, History Rage is really starting to build some uh, some traction now. You're getting some really good names on who are happy. I think it's the attraction of giving people the opportunity to rant and rave. I think you've hit on something yeah. there. Yeah, just to get all off the chest, just get out there, say the things they've always wanted to say, but just too polite to come out with in public. Yeah, and they exactly. are doing that now. So yeah, so that's you and Paul doing that. And Paul hasn't been on a guest here yet, so we'll have to bring Paul on at some point to talk about something. Anyway, Definitely. you in the, you have a bit of an affection for Crete. It's where you, you go there for holidaying and World War II studies, and, and it's something a place that kind of got under your skin. So um, when did that start, before we get into the presentation? Well, I went there on holiday in 2019, and something just hit me. It was just the landscape, the people, the food, the history, just amazing all of it possibly with a little bit of sunstroke as well that may have helped um, but i just found the entire place fascinating and then came home started to read up a bit more i've always been interested in the second world war and so ooh, this was a ma fairly major battle and afterwards there was all these resistance networks and and spies and secret agents going back and forth and carrying out proper daring do almost James Bond style secret missions. And then obviously things happened and I had plenty of time to research stuff. And I fell into researching special operations executive in Greece and the Middle East and Crete. And, and the point as we've talked about before, the Mediterranean in that aspect is kind of underappreciated compared to the ETO, compared to the mm. Market Garden and, you know, and, and even in the Pacific, certain other battles seem to have more more attention than the Mediterranean. I think it's because mm. it's very complicated. Lots of nations, lots of participants, yes. lots of changing sides, lots of complicated resistance movements that have more than it's one faction. So I think yes. it's, 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 it's not something you can dive into quickly. It's as you found it, once you start, it's kind of a forever it will control your destiny kind of history, a, I guess. A little, yeah. I'm trying to look at being in a completely separate alphabet. The half of it doesn't really help. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, just trying to dive in and find out as much as I can. But anyway, you've come on with yes. a PowerPoint. So we're going to talk about a kidnap this time. So it's a first. I don't think we've done a kidnap operation on, on World War II TV. Someone will correct me and say, yes, you covered it in so-and-so. But from the top of, of my course. head, I don't think we have. I have done 530-something shows now. So I don't remember the ins and outs of every single one of them. But I'm going to hand it over to you. Um, folks, if you have questions... Far away as we go along, we can kind of do mm -hmm. ones about the details as we go along and kind of big, broader ones at the end, perhaps. But um, Kyle and myself are happy to answer them. So uh, over to you, sir. Okay, I'm going to try to work the controls here. But so uh, here we go. So we'll start off just with a little bit of background. May 1941, Battle of Crete. Uh, Germany invades Greece, conquers the mainland, and then moves on to conquer the island of Crete. Um, the battle lasts a couple of few days, incredibly ferocious between the British, Australian, New Zealanders and the Greeks and the German forces mainly invading from the air. Uh, it, it, despite heroically defending, the Allies lose, evacuate the mini Dunkirk and the island force of Germans. Within a few months, Special Operations Executive send in agents to try to track down Allied soldiers who've been left behind. 
quite a few made it off, but there were still thousands either taken prisoner or led into the mountains, into the hills, taken in by villagers and the fledgling resistance network. Um, as with other SOE activities, they try to link up with these resistance fighters and create cells of fighters and guerrillas to hopefully take the fight back to the Germans. One of which, one of these resistance leaders is this chap, uh, Patrick Lee Firmer. He's quite famous as a writer after the war, but even before the war starts, he's already led a fairly interesting life. He grows up at the, in the middle of the First World War. His parents move to India and leave him behind. So he grows up a fairly idyll idyllic rural childhood, running around the woods, around the fields, basically playing with all the children in the local village. His parents come back, they want him to go to a proper school, become an engineer. And he really doesn't like that idea. He's very good at languages, he's very good at history, not so much the technical side of things. And he also doesn't really respond well to taking orders and being told what to do. So he gets expelled from basically every single school he gets sent to. And he's also expelled for shock hover, holding hands with a local girl. Disgusting. Oh, no, how, how dare he? Um, he toys the idea of going to Sandhurst, but then decides to become a writer instead. That doesn't really pan out either. So he sets off on an adventure across Europe with nothing but the clothes on his back, a few books of poetry, and a small backpack to carry his stuff in. And he walks in 1939, 1933, at the age of 18, from Holland all the way to Constantinople. On the way, he takes part in a cavalry charge in Greece against rebels and uh, gets engaged to a Romanian uh, noblewoman. So he's, even before he's 20, he's already led an incredibly interesting life. The Second World War starts, he immediately volunteers and comes back home and joins the Irish Guards. Now, for a man who doesn't respond well to taking orders, the life of an officer in the Guards doesn't really suit him. There's too much marching up and down too much polishing boots, too much ironing uniforms. He just doesn't like it. But on his journey across Europe, he's learned to speak multiple languages. He can speak German, he can speak Greek fluently. And so he joins the General List, which, as I understand it, is sort of a collection of various specialists and uh, eccentrics who don't really fit in any other regiment or unit. He gets sent back to Greece, works as a li liaison officer there. He takes part in the Battle of Greece, the Battle of Crete, and is evacuated with the main of the Allied forces. When SOE, a recruiting for agents, he signs up because he can speak Greek and he knows the landscape fairly well and he's sent back in uh, basically to run operations there. And, and if there he is such in. a thing as an archetypal early recruit to SOE, he's kind of it, isn't it? I mean, yeah. and not just SOE, all these fledgling, we've talked about it so often before, the LRDG, the early days of the SAS, the Parachute Com Regiment Commandos, it's a lot of misfits is a polite yeah. way of saying people who have got skills, but their skills aren't best suited to a rigid, yeah. strict military kind of um, organization, but they can be incorporated into something like SOE, which needs these kind of people who have yeah. that on the ground knowledge. So, you know, it, 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 he's a legend in that regard of just the type of person that came along and they, they do, although they're misfits, they do sort of, most of these people share some kind of similarity. They, 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 they're the, they're the same sort of people, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. They're a good, a decent chap is how I yeah. think they would be a described. A decent the chap. Time. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I occasionally joke that he got in because he could speak Greek. But when you think about that in 1939, that's a fairly rare skill to have. It's not like you can just whip out your mobile phone and go onto Google Translate. Knowing how to speak another language is incredibly useful and fairly there. I guess a few people would know ancient Greek, wouldn't they? Because like yes. Latin, it's good, but that's it's a foundation for understanding modern Greek. Yes. But it's not. You can't go through as an agent speaking ancient Greek any more than you could speak Latin yeah. in occupied Italy. It's a it's a yeah. good it's a good route, but it's it, yeah it's but speaking actual Greek modern, that you yes. can be understood. And, and not be standing out amongst peasant stock would be a real task, wouldn't it? Indeed. There was an SOE agent in Crete who signed up because he could speak ancient Greek and misunderstood and had to have a translator provided for him. That's how different languages are. They're recognisable, yeah. but very different. 
Uh, proceeding on, uh, basically, the SOE send in agents and do, do what SOE does. Until, hang on, next slide, the Italian armistice. Um, with, in the run up to the invasion of Italy, as we're seeing with the film Operation Mincemeat, which is out in cinemas now, plug, plug. Um, there was a grand deception campaign to make it look like the Allies were going to invade Greece, which includes having SOE basically activate their resistance cells and start carrying out attacks against the Germans. The Greeks take this to mean that the invasion is going to be in Greece and rise up and start attacking German outposts, the German convoys, everything you would expect to prepare for an invasion. And as the invasion isn't coming, they're incredibly brutally suppressed. The, the resistance uh, massacred and destroyed as a, as a fighting force, effectively. Um, fa this, this chap, uh, Cap General Angelico Carter, is in charge of the Italian uh, occupiers of the island. They've occupied the eastern side of, of Crete and are basically just sitting around, enjoying the wine, fraternizing with the locals, not really keen on this whole war business sort of captain crowley's mandolin style if you've if anyone's read or seen that the, and general carter isn't too keen on this idea of putting down a rebellion fighting the greeks fighting people he, who are only really fighting for their own country he's a royalist he's there to fight for italy not for mussolini so he's not keen on oppressing other people and lee firma convinces him to defect they have a secret meeting between General Carter and his intelligence officer and Lee Firma, and they kind of hash out that they're going to do a fake kidnapping. They're going to jump into the general's car, drive it out into the hills, abandon it on the roadside, and then walk the rest of the way and be taken off by some marine. And that's basically what they do. It goes off without a hitch. The general, they leave the car, the general walks along happily, taking swigs of neat triple sec hidden in the water bottle, whilst regaling them with tales of his life in Rome and with the royal family. And they're taken off at the end of September 1943, leaving the island basically to its fate. So we're going to the next plan. Uh, there's a, there is a, there's another, sorry, getting a bit, getting a bit ahead of myself, but there's, there was a plan in 1942 to do the same with a German general if they could kidnap the, the commander of the general, German garrison, it would improve Greek morale, damage German morale, and help hopefully boost the war effort with, at very little cost and very little expense. So Lee Firma comes up with a plan to kidnap this chap, uh, general, general Friedrich Wilhelm Müller, who is the commander of the 22nd Air Landing Division who are occupying now all of the island. Uh, this chapter has been given the nickname the Butcher of Crete because of his incredible brutality and habit of just massacring everything in his path. If someone shoots a German soldier, the village that person's from will be burnt down and everyone killed. He's that sort of borderline cartoon villain if this wasn't real life and real people mm -hmm. being killed. Uh, so they figure if they take out this guy, it'll massively increase morale, show the Greeks that they haven't been abandoned and that it was they weren't just being used as part of a deception for Italy. Uh, so there's a bit of back and forth between Lee Firma and SOE command about whether they should actually go through with this. If it doesn't pan out, what is the butcher of Crete going to do to the people who'd helped the people who are trying to kidnap him? What is his replacement going to do? Will this actually be worth it? But eventually Lee Firma wins over and they go ahead with the plan. And this is it's interesting because we by forty three, you know that, that a year earlier there'd been the Hydric assassination, which mm. we remind ourselves it was the Czech government in exile that really pushed for that, and then SOE supported it. But that had, you know, re resulted in the reprisals and Lidditz yes. and what have you. So there's a by this point in the war by forty three there have been special operations things that have gone very well and aided the war and things that haven't got so very gone so very well that maybe have made things worse so it's that interim era where lots yeah. of ideas are coming from all over the place because by this point there are people embedded in france and crete and and we're talking about the far east as well and they've been on the boots on the ground for some time so they have a local picture and they have they're having yes. ideas from a local level then there's headquarters having a more global view of things and as you know you'll tell us 
that sometimes that, that these two views of how to win the war are are kind of a, a loggerheads because the global yes. view that the, the, the planners are thinking they're thinking big game whereas the people on the ground they've got to know people they they're trusted by locals they've got their 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 friends there they're seeing things maybe in a blinkered way yeah. um for, for of what's going on right on the ground yeah in this instance lee firm is very firm in the belief that the cretans will rise up and the greeks will win the day through their own strength and courage whereas the command are starting to look towards the next war yeah. Effectively, the Cold War has already started. The Greek Civil War is being fought between communists and right-wing royalists. And that's sort of happening in the shadows. They need to consider how this will play out on a wider political spectrum as well. If, if this mission fails, this is a perfect propaganda coup for the communists who can say, the British don't really care about you, the royalists don't really care about you. Look how easily they threw away your lives and the lives of your fellow villagers for mm -hmm. a foolhardy... Uh, Stunt, basically, yeah. how they would see it. And they might, however, they do go ahead with the mission, and they recruit Lee Firm recruits a team, starting with this chap, uh, William Stanley Moss, a captain in the Coldstream Guards. He's an experienced soldier. He's fought in in North Africa. He really knows what he's doing, and he's basically brought in as the muscle. He's going to be the, the getaway driver, and there to be. An ex a soldier if they need extra extra firepower. They also bring in this chap, George Tira Tirakis. He's a Greek soldier. He's fought in Albania. He's fought the Italians from the very start of the war for Greece. He's fought in Greece against the Germans, and he's fought against them again in Crete before joining the resistance. So he's been in, in it for a very long time. He knows what he's doing. And he's a Greek himself. He can speak the language. He knows the train. Perfect. We also bring in another Greek, this one, this chap called Manoli Patarakis. He's a Cretan police officer. So he's in a position of authority. He knows the landscape like the back of his hand. He knows exactly where everything is. He also knows who the local miscreants are, who can be trusted, who can't. And he also has been taking part in the resistance since the invasion. So we surround, so we put together this core team of experienced officers and experienced resistance fighters who know can be, you know they can trust them and they know everything will work together. They can work together perfectly. And got let's check the notes. Uh, he, this plan put together over the winter of 1943, 1944. So they can't really go in by boat. They don't say why they're going by plane, but I think it's because the weather's too rough, the seas will be too rough to go in by boat. So they go off for parachute training in Haifa and then proceed to Italy and Brindisi Airfield to launch the mission. So on at about six o'clock in the evening on the 4th of February, they take off from Brindisi Airfield. As you can see at the center of the picture, there's a pin at the center of Greece. They, the plane drops off a load of supplies to resistance fighters there and then proceeds on to Crete. Uh, question, what's that on their heads if I go back? Uh, that's the parachute training helmet so they don't crack their skulls open on the plane door whilst they're in training, if that makes sense. Yeah, sorbo rubber, wasn't it? And uh, that, yeah. it, it's one of those things, it's impossible to make it look sexy. You know, yeah. it's uh, you, you, you just look like you've got a biscuit tin on your head and that's that's it. But that that's what they use, isn't it? Early yeah. days, yeah. I, I laughed out loud looking at this picture of them because that's Patrick Lee Firm in the centre with his arms folded, trying to look as cool as he can and he, it's just not working, is it's it? Not, it's not going to work. With that hat on, you can't... No, You know, even, even Brad Pitt wouldn't look cool in that hat. You know, mm. it's just, you know... It's never going to work, but yeah, yeah. interesting. <laughs> so they, so the problem with Greek with Crete is it's basically three mountain chains sticking out of the sea. So you can't really land in the middle of the island. You can't really land on the coast like the Germans did because now the Germans are occupying it. So there's only a few limited landing spots you can choose from. Uh, Lee Firma chooses this spot near to the village of Kritzer on the eastern side of the island in the Lassithi Mountains. Uh, it's in a valley, which means the plane can only make one run at a time. They can't all jump out together like a stick of paratroopers. So in the now in the early hours of the morning, Lee Firma 
volunteers to go first. He's the leader of the mission, so he volunteers to lead the way. They Once they're over the drop zone, three signal fires are lit by resistance fighters on the ground. Lee Firma jumps out, his chute opens, and everything goes perfectly. He hits the ground within seconds. Even before he's unhooped his parachute, the fighters have met up with him. There's hugs and handshakes and welcomings all around. It's gone off perfectly. Unfortunately, by the time the plane has done a circuit and come back around for another run in, the weather's changed because this is still early February and is the middle of winter. The mountains are now covered in, in fog and clouds and they can't see the plane and the plane can't see them. They try several other circuits of, of the drop zone, but nothing's working. They have to call it off and, and head for home. There's, over the next couple of weeks, they try to make another drop, but the weather's rough. It's too windy. It's too cold. The gears and the plane seize up. It's cloudy again. There's too much flak. The Germans spot them. It all goes off plan. And Lee Firm is there for weeks and weeks, living amongst locals, but also putting together reconnaissance, getting the plan up and running. So flash forward a little to the 4th of April. Everything seemed to happen in fours. Uh, the rest of the team have returned to Egypt and they're going to try to land by motor launch from uh, Mersa Mutra on the northern coast of Egypt, basically just going straight across the sea and landing at night. Uh, in William Moss's book, Ill Met by Moonlight, it opens an incredibly vivid passage of the boat cutting the engines and slowly gliding towards the beach, the scent of herbs on the mist and the mountains behind them. They land on the beach, they meet up with Lee Firmer again, who's now in, who's now grown a moustache, he's been there for so long. He's wearing traditional Christian clothes, he's disguised as a shepherd, and he's got a team together working, working on the plan. Unfortunately, it's been so long that General Muller has been replaced. He's been sent off to the mainland and the Dodecanese Islands to wreak havoc there. So instead, the new commander of the island is General Heinrich Kreiper, a veteran of the Eastern Front. He's been fighting in Russia and is basically sent to Crete for a little bit of relaxation and a promotion. But nonetheless, the plan, the plan goes ahead. They're going to try to kidnap him instead. One German general is as good as another. Except we, we, we talked about Muller earlier, Kyle, as being this, yes. you know, this butcher. Um, so you can absolutely see a reason for getting rid of him because, mm. you know, for the morale. But this guy, what what would um, who was the first to find out he had replaced? Was it was it the, the, the guys on the ground in, in yes. Crete or was it at headquarters via Ultra or something they found out? Uh, yes, in Crete. They, they found out in Crete. They knew he had been replaced by ob by observing the headquarters in the center of the island. And did they did they check with? You know, by radio that they should still go ahead or do they take the decision yes. themselves? Yeah, it was radioed in that if the island had changed hands, but it was still go ahead anyway. I say one German general is as good as yeah. another. Okay. And they're there now, so you, I guess you yeah. might as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's already it's already in motion. Go and go and make it happen if you can. Uh just check around on with my notes. So while Lee Firm has been on the island, they've done reconnaissance. So they found out that the general travels from his HQ in a town called Arhenaeus, and basically the smack center of the island, to his personal villa just outside the archaeological site of Knossos on the edge of the main city, Heraklion. He, he said the follows the same route every day. It takes about 15 minutes to get there. It's not a very long journey at all, and they can plan out the route exactly. It might be a little bit difficult to see on the map, but just below the, the marker where it says A, there's a very sharp turn in the road. Yeah, we can see it. Which, yeah, yeah it's, it's visible even on this zoomed out map. And they figure that will be the place to grab him if they can. They also sneak into town and have disguises made. Uh, a, a friendly tailor makes them German uniforms out of scraps he's been sent to repair. And they come up with two military police officer um, track, track cop uniforms, basically. Uh, the longer you look at these disguises, the worse they get. They're clearly not actually German uniforms. 
but they're good enough. These aren't uniforms to sneak around a barracks and have a polite chat with the, with the guards. This is to get the car to, General's car to stop. And if can do that, perfect. Job done. And generally, Carl, in Crete, I mean, if you if you were a German officer or of any rank there, was there constant danger from resistance uh, attacking convoys and cars and things? Was it you know, on a scale of one to ten? Kind of how how nervous were they making journeys on a daily basis? I would say fairly, fairly, fairly um, concerned. There were local guerrillas operating all over the island, carrying out attacks against checkpoints and convoys. Um, they may. Most attacks were again, by what I can tell, were against fixed positions where convoys were shot up and attacked in drive-by shootings and ambushes. Um, I've read one account of German soldiers putting Greek women and children in their vehicles to try to discourage hmm. attacks, which does suggest that there were attacks on vehicles as well. Yeah. Um, apparently, according to uh, William Stanley Moss in his account, the general was concerned there would be an ambush at the exact point they were ambushed and had ordered that there be a new checkpoint and outpost built specifically to deter what, exactly what would happen to him. So they get all of these disguises and what, whilst they're there, they meet up with other resistance fighters and a local guerrilla commander offers him some of their men some of his men to sort of bulk up the forces, provide a little bit of extra muscle, a bit of extra firepower if it's needed. So here's an overhead view of the ambush site. They set up a base camp in a vineyard a few miles away from the site and plan to walk there on the day of the mission. As you can see, the road in the centre is the historical road, the road that this took place on. The one on the right-hand side is a bit more modern. But you can see how sharp that turn is. You really have to put the brakes on and almost come to a dead stop. You can't see around the corner. Uh, they, they're also armed with pistols and commando daggers, which you can just notice sticking out of their belts. Ah, yep. Sticking out of their belts yep. in the centre of the picture. But as I say, this is very obvious. They're not German soldiers. But they're also carrying something called a life preserver, which is basically a metal, a massive metal ball bearing on a spring. It's then wrapped in leather, a sort of cosh or baton, something you can use in close combat uh, without actually killing your opponent. So the general sets off late at night. They, it's a little bit later than expected. The general stayed late with his men to play cards. So Lee Firm and the ambush team are waiting very patiently, starting to get worried. Has he changed the route? Has somebody told them something's going on? Have they, have the, has, has he just left? Has, he, it's all, has it all gone wrong? But eventually, after a few hours of waiting, they get a signal from one of their men who's keeping watch down the road. One flash of light from his torch, meaning the general's coming and he's by himself. There's no guard, there's no outriders, there's no other vehicles. It's just him in the car. Now, this is the ambush site itself, basically taking the opportunity to show you my holiday photos. Um, the general's car will be coming towards the camera here, so he's coming around this bend. And you can see just how sharp it is. There's a hill to the left with lookouts, keeping an eye on things, and a pretty much vertical drop on to the right. So you have to stay on this road and you have to slow down to get around it. You may not be able to tell very clearly from the photo of this size, but at the center of the road, the road sort of tilts downwards towards the valley as well. So if you stop, the driver will have to put his handbrake on or keep his foot on the brake. Which yeah, and obviously no crash barriers in World War II either. Yeah. Exactly. So the driver will definitely be going around this corner very, very slowly. And just to show you from the general's, general and his driver's side, this is looking towards the ambush point. That van happened to pass just as I was taking the photo, and you can see even in broad daylight, he's really slamming the brakes on and going around it very carefully. Keep in mind, mm. this takes in pitch darkness at, at night. So we get to the ambush point. They see the car coming. They step out into the middle of the road. They also have sort of the traffic cop, sort of you know the big white thing to slow down, the wave the torches at him, and the general's car comes to a halt. 
Uh, Lee, Lee Firma approaches the general side, and Stanley, William Stanley Moss approaches the driver's side. Lee Firma shines the torch directly in the general's face and asks him, General's, general's car, General's wagon? And says, yeah, yeah, yeah. The general didn't like to be stopped. Immediately, there's a flurry of action. They rip the car doors open. Lee Firma grabs the general and throws him to the floor. The general's driver panics and tries to reach for his pistol, and Moss coshes him over the head with a life preserver and drags him out and throws him to the floor as well. Uh, Manoli and uh, Petrakis and the two Greek resistance fighters spring up and drag the general back into the car. They throw him into the footwell. The other fighters who have been provided by the guerrilla leader drag the driver off and take him elsewhere. The Lee Firma scoops up the general's hat, which has fallen off, and puts it on his own head. They jump into the passenger seat and driver's seat and speed off into the night. So the entire thing lasts about 30 seconds from start to finish. It's over in a flash. So they're heading, speeding through the night, heading towards the north coast where they're going to leave the car. And as they did with the Italian general, abandon it and make it look like they've been taken off elsewhere whilst they proceed on foot. Now, according to Ill Met by Moonlight, uh, Moss's own account of the raid, they pass through numerous German checkpoints where they all open the barriers, let them through, saluting them all the way. He says there's something like 27 checkpoints. This is a little bit unlikely and it's a bit of an exaggeration, but they do travel past German convoys through German checkpoints and they pay them no mind. The general's car is flying his tenants. There's clearly a man wearing a general's hat in the passenger seat. So they're just waved through. Yep, yep. Good evening, General. Thank you. Blah, blah, blah. And what distance are we talking about, Kyle? It's not too far. It's about a few, only a few miles, less than a, less than 10 minutes drive. So 27 checkpoints is, is yeah, yeah. <laughs> a bit unlikely, isn't it, they, really? They, they, I, I love both of them dearly, but they do tend to exaggerate. They clearly exaggerate slightly in there. Well, in then, you know, this memoirs. will come up at the end, won't it? We've talked about it on previous shows. It's those memoirs from the sort of 40s, yeah. 50s, 60s, when there weren't archives available. And they were all great reads. Uh, and it's yeah. where all these legends start. We talked about it with Ian Fleming this afternoon. And, you know, they're writing it. And maybe the copy editor saying, you know, put down two tanks because it sounds better than one armored yeah. car. And, you know, three checkpoints doesn't sound good enough. Put in 10. And by the you know, it's that it's yeah. that era. And we're now in the era where we can compare with the archives yes, and look at these definitely. things and go, you know what, there's a little bit of exaggeration. And, and um, yeah. Um, I, yeah. I'll, I'll get into that in a, in a few minutes, but there is a very good example of that coming up. Right, super. Yeah. Um, so they speed off into the night. Unfortunately, they, the plan was to go around the main town, Karakron, but they take a wrong turn and accidentally drive straight through the center of the town. It was a little, obviously there were fewer cars back then, but this is the sort of streets they're running down. They're very narrow, lots of twists, lots of turns, but they, and they don't really know where they're going. But they do make it through the town and come up to the main gate through the Venetian walls. And this is a occupied checkpoint. They have to go through here. And it's swarming with German soldiers. The, the people, the two resistance fighters in the back seat with the general sort of in the foot while crouched down so they can't be seen. They approach the guard and shout General's Wagen, General's car, and floor it. And they fortunately open the gate and let them through, and they're away into the night. They drive for several miles and get to the coast. Whilst they're doing this, Lee Firma speaks to General and assures him, we are British officers and these are Greek soldiers. You're in safe hands if you if you behave responsibly, behave well, you're put as a prisoner, and you'll have our parole. And the general agrees. They ditch the car on the north coast near a beach that's known to have submarines and clandestine activity taking place. And this is where the all the accounts differ. In Lee Firm's account that he wrote immediately after his official war record. He says they leave a letter pinned to the driver's seat saying that this is a British operation. These were British officers. No, no Greek resistance fight took place. And there's to be no reprisals. This was a British operation. They make that very clear. And they also leave a raiding forces cap badge on the driver's seat. By, by 
Gilded by Moonlight, only a few years after, 1950, William Starling Moss's account, they leave cigarette ends and cigarette packets lying all over the place and a, and a great coat on the back seat. By Lee Firmer's account in 2001, they leave, a, a leave all of that. They leave uh, an Agatha Christie novel. They just leave, the, the account, what, what they leave behind, changes so much. You can't really be sure. But they did definitely leave a note pinned to the driver's seat because this is mentioned in Ultra Decrypts right. reporting that the general's been kidnapped. So some of this did definitely happen, but it might be slightly exaggerated as the years go on. Because the question did come up, Norma, I think, mentioned it about, oh, yes. you know, that the, the threat of reprisal clearly is hanging over anything you do in an occupied country, yeah. especially following what happened in Czechoslovakia. So um, it doesn't mean that you, I mean, someone else said, um, it's, you know, these things have war, 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 very little regard is often put on civilians. And, and if there's a genuine target to be made, we know that, you know, we were bombing places with civilians, we were, the Allies have to win a war. So, if yes. they considered this risk worth taking, and we will come up to whether or not this whole thing was worth it when we get to the end of this, but it is interesting they they leave a note. But I I can see more stuff being added to what they left to kind of reinforce this yeah. idea that that they're they're covering their asses in a sense about you know no no we definitely didn't want anything yeah they wanted to know this was British and it's it's interesting but it does yeah. folks it does mean that where if you're if you are studying stuff yourself this is the interesting thing is that you will get to these points where you have conflicting information in the end you kind of either have to explain them all or pick one and go with it don't you? yeah i i can't account for why they account why these separate reports of the same event are different other than someone's exaggerating at some point yeah it's just interesting stuff but yeah yeah that's what makes this interesting and makes this more of an adventure this is definitely an adventure and that's how they describe it as such they literally call it our adventure over and over again. This is our, basically growing up schoolboys off, off on a jolly. Uh, so to proceed, they then hike directly across Mount Ida. This is a mysterious mountain. This is twice the size of Ben Nevis. As you can see from the map, they go around the foothills and then try to get to the south coast. Along the way, they meet various resistance fighters, different guerrilla bands who take them into their protection, who, who look after them, provide them with food, and they sort of get to know each other. They never refer to the general by name or use the word general or strategos. They always refer to him by code. But they, Lee Firmer and the general sort of, not necessarily become friends, but become attached to each other. They both speak Greek, they're both scholars of ancient history, and according to Lee Firmer, they watch the dawn rise over the mountain and recite Roman poetry to each other. Whether that happened or not is again debatable, but it is accounted in both their actual wartime diaries that this happened. So something along those lines did take place. It's very romantic, isn't it? And the fact it's in yeah. the German account as well, it, you know, you kind of think it probably is true, but it is, yeah. you know, we're going to come up to it. This you use the word adventure and that's the thing that when, you know, when like Guy Walters talks about the great escape, this, there's this um, idea of it being sort of upper class adventures as opposed mm -hmm. to serious attempts to win the war. And, you know, the, the chivalry that is sort of being shown here yeah. at this very same time in 1944, there's all sorts of monstrous things happening in the world elsewhere between the you know, Germans and allied forces. So, these kind of yeah. stories, they're, they're romanticised and they're, 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 they were wonderful, these kind of books to read when I was a kid and a teenager. But now I've got old and cynical. I, 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 kind, of, yeah. I kind of hold up a bullshit card at a certain yeah. point and go, it's not really real. It's not really an example of real warfare, if that, that makes yeah. sense. Uh, hopefully I can bring that around at the end. But, yeah. Um, yeah. To, to massive spoilers here, but they get off the island. In the 70s, I think, they meet up again on a Greek TV show. And General Kreiper is flat out asked, how were you treated? And he says, like a knight with chivalry. That's how he's been treated. Obviously, there's a great history and culture of hospitality. But even so, people are coming out to see him. People are coming to watch this almost parade of these soldiers and resistance fighters taking this general through their village down to the coast. Hmm. Now, there's eight, about 18 days of walking across mountains here, so I'm going to skip ahead quite a bit, because it's a bit Lord of the Ringsy, people walking across a mountain. 
Eventually, they get to the South Coast. And again, to show what the boy's own silly adventure this is, they get to their land, the place where they're going to be picked up, and they can't remember the code to send. They've got a torch, and they're supposed to send out a Morse signal, but they've forgotten what the signal is. At one point, they're sending just sending SS, SS, SS out to sea. I can't imagine what message that would send. Um, but another agent who's also been taken off basically meets them, grabs a torch, calls them fools, and sends out the real signal, which is SBS, SBS, SBS. And who shows up for none other than the actual SBS who are, who are waiting off the coast? They pull up in dinghies and evacuate them. Apparently, they were quite disappointed that they just got on the boat and sailed away. They were expecting a sort of chase, a heroic gun battle, lots of shooting, lots of action. And they ask, where are the Jerrys? And uh, actually, there's only the one, and we're just going to sort of um, wander off, if that's okay. But that's it. They, they, that's it. they uh, sail back to Egypt, uh, and General Crapper is handed over to the military police. They have a final meal and a final photograph of each other. They shake hands and part ways. Uh, Lee Firma gets the DSO, and Moss gets the military cross. And just to flash forward a bit, uh, Crapper is taken to Trent Park. Now, if you've read Helen Fry's book, The Walls of, Here, of Ears, this is where German officers were housed, sort of wined and dined and treated well, but all the while being secretly recorded and profiles are drawn up, and transcripts are made of what they're saying to each other, who's sort of working together, and General Crapper is one of these people. He's flat out asked during his interview, do you know anything about gassing of prisoners on the Eastern Front? And he's overheard speaking to another general, basically about the Holocaust and how much he knew. One of the questions was, uh, would would General Crabbe have taken part in massacres and been just as brutal as Muller? Um, probably not, because one of the things he overheard saying was the treatment of the Jews and treatment of civilians on the East has been shameful. So he may not have been quite as bad as, as, the, as his predecessors. But we're trying to get to the sort of the aftermath of here. Was this mission really worth it? And to be honest, even though I love the people involved and I love this idea of this grand adventure, it didn't really achieve anything. When General Muller came back, he replaced Kriper immediately, and nothing happened. Kriper himself wasn't able to provide any information. In fact, he is described as um, rather unimportant in his report. Mm. So nothing really came of it. I've kind of built this all up, and then nothing happened. There was well, no no, that's the point, isn't it? That, yeah. that is... That... This, this is what we're doing. We're examining this here because I'm mean, sure a lot of people watching here have seen the, the Dirk Bogard film, it met, Ill Met by Moonlight, mm. with, with um, Marius Goring as the German general. Mm. And, um, and it's, it's one of those movies now that sits out of place because it's, it's romanticized. There's never any real yeah. sense of peril there. There's never any sense that the, the people on Crete are in any danger there. It's, it's, it's very. It's a good. It's a good film in the sense of it's of its time, but it, yeah. it's out of place con, 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 when you yeah. compare it with really serious studies of of combat and and loss of life. And it's a bit. It's not comic in its in its playing, but it's it's not overly dramatic, is it? Yeah. Um, there um, is there are reprisals against the Cretans, but this but this takes place in August. There's something called the Holocaust of Kedros, where 160 yeah. people are massacred their villages, burned. But as I said, this takes place in August, months later. So more than likely, this was done as a sort of scorched earth retreat as the Germans move into enclaves in the main cities. So the, G the British didn't get anything from him. The Germans didn't really care that they'd lost him. And the Cretans just carried on with their resistance. Maybe there was a big a resistance a boost for morale for the resistance who saw this great heroic mission happen with their involvement but for the wider war nothing really changed yeah have you got any more slides to show i think you've got one or yep. two there's one more slide to show I just want to round off i would say the human cost of this mission um they planned for the mission to be completely bloodless they didn't want anyone to be killed as i said they wanted to make sure this was a british operation and that no one died 
So the Germans have no recourse to reprisal. They can't say, well, you killed the general, you killed his driver, we're going to kill 100 villagers in reprisal. Unfortunately, the general's driver, Alfred Fensk, was killed during the operation. Uh, when we left off, he'd just been bludgeoned over the head, yep. having reached for his pistol, and was dragged off by other resistance fighters. Um, there's, con- there's three separate accounts of his death that I've found so far that sort of intertwine together. Um, having been hit over the head, they were supposed to meet up. He was very dazed, staggered, couldn't really walk, and they couldn't really make it to the rendezvous point to meet up with the general later. So they, the resistance fighters who were carrying him may have taken the fairly cold, but practical decision to just kill him to speed up things and help them get away with patrols closing in. Another account says that he stood up to try and signal and wave to a patrol that was passing by when they grabbed him and, and killed him to try and silence him. And another account says that he sort of shifted position whilst they were hiding, and one of the fighters thought he was going to stand up and killed him on the spot to try and silence him. Um, he, his throat was cut. We know his throat was cut with a dagger, and then his head cut off. This is this yeah. is the brutal nature of guerrilla warfare, unfortunately. Um, his body was found and buried in the German cemetery. His head was carried off and taken as a rather grisly trophy. Um, his family didn't know what happened to him until the German translation of Ill Met by Moonlight. So in the fifth, we're talking the 50s here. And they wrote to both William Stanley Moss and General Cryer for asking what had happened to him to no avail. Uh, his son travelled to Crete in 2008 trying to find out what happened to him and is apparently confronted with the rather grisly knowledge that his father's head had been kept in a box in a tavern in, near the town where he was killed. Um, a Greek journalist managed to find out what had gone on and he was um, reburied and his body parts reunited in, in the German cemetery. I've not linked to it or put a picture of it in the slideshow just out of decency, but if you go onto the Battle of Crete Facebook page, the journalist who helped helped his son find more information about it has put pictures of of, of the box. It's quite wow. a sight. Quite a reminder that this isn't an heroic adventure. This is life and quite brutal death. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Um yeah, yeah, sorry any... to end on the downer there. No, no, no. Any, any more images, or should we just have, do our round yep. up? Yep. There's a, just to round off, there's now a memorial on the ambush site listing the names of people who took part. Wow. Well, brilliant stuff. Yes. And I think um, now we'll just kind of do some yes, conclusions please. and some questions, really, because I think what we're doing is we're, we, we, we are reevaluating these sort of boys' own missions. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, 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 the Ill Met My Bo- Moonlight book and film doesn't raise any moral questions it doesn't they don't portray that obviously yeah. what happened to the driver there yeah. and i think we can now say that the soe and all its all its brother organizations clearly contributed to the winning of the war but along the way there were some operations that yeah. you can look along and say you know what probably wasn't worth it you know and yeah. it, as we said being 44 is an interesting era because the Allies are winning the war now. The gambles yes. that they had to take earlier in the war. I mean, David O'Keefe reminded us earlier how it, vital it was to try and win that Battle of the Atlantic, and that meant uh, breaking the Enigma codes and things like that. So these missions then were, were things were hanging on it. It was yeah. it was life and death. But by forty four, you know, it is interesting. So what's what's you know you said there that you 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 know you you you're fascinated by the country. You love the characters here, but clearly. You're kind of thinking it probably wasn't just wasn't worth it, yeah. Yeah, if it if it had been carried out when it was first planned in 1942, it might have been worth it. But by 44, the Germans are packing up and getting ready to leave anyway. As I said, they were launching these scorched earth massacres to cover their escape within months of this mission anyway. So they could have just basically just sat sat tight and waited for the Germans to leave. There was, there was yeah. this hope that there would be this, this big battle where, they, where the Cretan population would rise up and overthrow the Germans with the help of the British army, and it just doesn't pan out. They just, the, the British arrive in the middle of '44, and they just sort of look at the Germans across no man's land and just sort of like, are you going to go? Are we going to go? What's happening? And it just sort mm. of fizzles out. 
I mean, I suppose they could have got something from him at Trent Park. Maybe yes. he, he might have known something really important to the war effort. And if yeah. if and we'd be talking about this 78 years one, whatever it is, yeah. going, well, isn't that incredible? That's the moment we found out about X. Yeah. And, we were, and the Allies are able to implement something to sort out X. Maybe he would yeah. have had, he'd been part of the ME 262 jet program or something, or he'd had access. Yeah. And it just started the Allies on some kind of route to, to breaking something that was significant. But he, di he didn't have that information. Or if he did, he didn't tell anybody yeah. in Trent Park at the time. So, as, as Norma said there, you know, 20, hindsight is twenty twenty, And I suppose yes. it didn't cost any Allied lives this. The reprisals in August, you could say, probably aren't directly connected with this. So I guess a risk worth taking, but yeah. it could have gone up. It could have gone worse, but it could have gone better. Yes, it could have gone a lot better. They, they, are, they do ask him fairly specific questions like, do you know about poison gas? Do you know, they ask him, do you know anything about super weapons that have been developed? Yeah. And he, he doesn't know anything. Mm. As, as I say, he's, they consider him unimportant. Yeah. So the, the theme of this week has been, in addition to things that happened, things that didn't happen. In your study of the SOE in Crete, in sort of 41, 42, 43, is there anything that you've come up with that, that you thought, well, if they had done this, that might, you know, any any plans that were proposed that you, I mean, you said a kidnapping of a gentleman in 42 would have made more difference. Anything mm. else? Any Anything that you've, you they missed the trick by not doing? They, they did have a plan to basically storm the headquarters with machine guns and shoot everyone inside. That may have, if this that would have got General Mueller especially. Um, there is a plan to plant limpet mines to shipping in Heraklion Harbour, in the main harbour. Um, quite a lot of supplies going in and out of North Africa come through Crete just by virtue of geography. So if they could have hit those ships, they could have potentially affected things in Africa. Unfortunately, the people who can swim aren't brave enough to jump over the barbed wire fences and swim with a limpet mine strapped to them. And the ones who are brave enough to do it don't know how to swim. So again, that sort of fizzles out. There is a plan to put uh, itching powder in the underwear of German officers. That may have... may have. Uh, you saw the a plot from the Beano comic, Kyle. I, I, I did read, I think. <laughs> have, I, have I read that? But yes, itching powder in the underwear. But again, that doesn't really pan out and probably wouldn't have been that useful anyway. And, and, and this comes back to this idea we said at the beginning of bringing in these these people who have this kind of independent, I'm just going to walk across Europe and, and marry a Romanian, whatever. You know, these yeah. kind of people have relationship with the race. Their assets are their language skills, their mm. ability to, to, to know countries. But with that, you're bringing on these people who are somewhat wackadoodle in a good yes. way, but they're, 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 they don't think conventionally. So, you know, you the staff are going to have to sift through their ideas i mean mm. as we talked about with with ian fleming ian fleming has fingers in lots and lots of pies and some of the stuff come up with is is silly but a lot of it is really good so you know people like patrick lee Ferber, yeah. they are important representation of british pluck if nothing yes. else even if yes. perhaps you can go didn't really didn't shorten mm. the war mm. didn't you know yeah, they provide a good springboard for other other people and other units. The SOE and Crete provide a lot of intelligence and guides and groundwork for things like the SBS and SAS going in, launching raids on airfields and supply dumps. But don't, again, I, I'm really interested in them, but they don't really achieve anything themselves. It, it, but then, as we know, I mean, the... the these organizations are kind of fighting for their existence all the way through the war. The SOE, when Kate Vigers is one, they have, and you've had her a guest on your pod as well. They, 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 lots of things go badly before it goes well. And there's lots of kind of ideas. And let's just scrap this. It's costing too much money. We're training agents who are getting shot and all over the place. So you, along yeah. the way, you need some successful things. Even I know 44 is late for this particular one, but you need even if it didn't achieve much, it still a, it goes in the success co co column in that it did yeah. what it was supposed to. So along yeah. the way, I suppose you know we think of uh, the SOE and their important role in Burma, for example. 
then these sorts of things are all fuel to keep the project going because there are hits along with the misses, I suppose. Yeah. Is the is the again that's looking at it a global point of view rather than in a, a focusing on this as an individual mission. Oh, definitely. The, the, individually, there's no big knockout punch mission that wins the war. But for a few dozen agents that working with local guerrilla fighters, they tie down two German divisions. And that's not much in the grand scheme of things. So that's two divisions that aren't in Italy, aren't in France, aren't on the Russian front. And they could be doing a lot of damage where they are, but they're stuck in Crete chasing after these resistance fighters. Mm. And as you know, as Jonathan Bending just said there, you know, resistance and SOE fighters were incredibly brave. I mean, it's a oh, yes. it's a trite comment, but it's an absolutely true and factual comment. Yeah. You know, our hats go off to anybody who's prepared to volunteer for any of these organizations and throw themselves out of plan planes or jump out of Lysanders or go on by boats into we're going more to be talking about the guys going into Borneo tomorrow. Any of those people are just hats off to them for, for what they were oh, brave yeah. enough to do. But oh, definitely. We're also in the era where we can look at the uh, the, the the results uh, of yeah. these and say, you know, perhaps, yeah. perhaps, I mean, I suppose with the amount of people involved, how, how many SOE people were ever sent into Crete? It's it's going to be a, a dozens, dozen, not hundreds, best. isn't it? Yeah, a, a dozen at best. Yeah. So, the, 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 if they let's say they sent a hundred agents of various types into 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 Crete over the course of the entire war. That's not that's not even a company of, of British infantry, yeah. is it? That that's not you're not you're not taking away from an asset, weakening it to put that yeah. number. And it wasn't anything like a hundred anyway. And if these people have skills and you can use them, who knows what they might have discovered? Who knows? Yeah, it's yeah. that's the thing. It's um yeah. Anyway, well, I think we've any uh, we've got no more questions coming in. I think yeah. I think we've answered everything yeah. really. Um, and it's. You can something can be inspiring at the same time as not necessarily very important, and I think yeah. that's what these missions are. When if folks, if you ha if you haven't ever read Ill Met by Moonlight or Patrick Lee Firma's book or or the other ones in that era, they're definitely worth reading. They're definitely um, of their time, but they're definitely worth understanding what sort of people were doing these things because you don't get people like Patrick Lee Firma these days, really. No. That they are of their age. Um, so yeah, it's interesting stuff. So, what are you working on next? And we'll give another plug for for the history history rage. Uh, well, we're carrying on with history rage. Uh, getting new guests on fairly regularly. So the next one will be out on Monday, I think. A bit will be launched fairly regularly. Um, and personally, I'm now researching the actual evacuation from Crete. What happened immediately after the battle, and what happened to all those men that were left behind. Well, there, there sounds like a subject we can bring you back on for in the future. So, well, well, there we are. It's a, it's a short but sweet one, this one, folks, because, you know, it, there's only so much you can pad out this story. And as I said, yeah, you, you, you said yourself, the trekking over the mountain bit becomes a little bit of another day, another swig of water from a canteen, another yeah. rock, another hill, another walk, another... Yeah, it's it's hard to make dash hiding in caves and walking over a mountain exciting unless you're actually doing it. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I'll just I'll just tell people we've got coming up tomorrow. I'll come and say goodbye in a second. So, folks, tomorrow we are finishing uh, Raids and Operations Week when Gavin Mortimer is on to talk about his new book. I will hold up. It's ready for tomorrow. Um, Z Special Unit. If you don't know anything about them, that is the British and Australian force that was doing all sorts of exciting things, mostly out in the Far East. So we're going to be focusing on Borneo tomorrow. Gavin was on more recently talking about uh, David Sterling. Who was and, and the, the founders of the SAS and Gavin is a prolific author and I can't wait to have him on tomorrow to talk about that. So if you haven't looked for that book, the link is in the uh, description of tomorrow's show with Gavin Mortimer. And then next week, on a changing tack completely, we're looking at minorities that served with various forces in World War II. So we have a show about the structure and organization of the Indian Army. We have a look at the Caribbean. Uh, air crews uh, on Monday, and there's another couple of shows I've still got to get scheduled on YouTube. And then, in folks, in May, it's going to be a bit hit and miss what I'm doing on World War II TV because I've got a few tours I've got to commit to. I'm going to earn some actual money doing some touring, and there's I'm going uh, away for a few days, so there'll be some shows and gaps and some shows, so it won't be quite as organized my theme weeks. But again, if you are new to World War II TV or you are not new to World War II TV, don't forget to like what you're watching. Please consider buying the books through the book links below. I so I can a little bit of commission on that. Please consider being our patron or a YouTube channel member and definitely check out 
Carl and Paul's History Rage podcast. Again, the link is in there below and check out their own Foreign Field YouTube channel where there's some really good shows there. There's one there about the Sykes Fairburn Commando Knife, for example. So the link to their channel is in the description below. So I have done my work to plug their various um, um, endeavors. I'll bring Kyle back in to say good evening. So there we are. We've done. It's brought in a nice, a nice 60 minute show. Anything yeah. else you want to say before we go? No, that's it. Just thanks everyone for the kind comments in the comment bar. You can follow me on Twitter at Kyle G History if you have any questions or comments or information about what we've talked about here. Brilliant. So there we are then. This is Paul Willard for World War Two TV saying I will see you all again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Have a good evening or have a good afternoon or morning, depending on where you are in the world. Cheers, everybody. Bye.